Double Cross, and Other Skills I Learned as a Super Spy by Jackson Pierce. Chapter 15 Otter and I stepped into the elevator lobby at exactly 8 o'clock. He gave me a bitter look, like he'd hoped I'd overslept. We cut down a short hallway and emerged in a parking lot behind the substitute teaching school. There, Otter unlocked a boxy-looking car with faded paint. I brushed some crumbs off the fabric seats before sitting down. Otter turned on the radio to a truly terrible country station and drove us out of Castlebury towards Fairview. It wasn't until the city, complete with the League's tower, came into view that we spoke. So, I'm Clifton Harris, and the file said, I live in Southern Oregon, I said. That's right, and I'm your dad. Don't make that face. I don't like it any more than you do. The doctors will do your exam in a room with computers that require a fingerprint scan every time they wake up from the sleep mode. So, when the doctor steps out of the room to get your test results, I'll install the program. You just sit there. Got it? Otter said. Sure thing. The Children's Hospital was an enormous building in the center of the city, just a few blocks over from the League's Tower. It was mostly white, but windows on the top floors were decked out in red, yellow, and blue curtains, and there was a giant fountain with a teddy bear in the center of the front courtyard. Otter pulled into a parking spot, then stalled there while he shut his eyes preparing for his character, I guessed. I checked my watch for the millionth time. This was going to be close. We were a little bit early. Let's go, Clifton. Otter turned the car off, pulled the parking brake, and then we both opened our doors. As Otter stepped out, he tapped the lock button on the driver's side. The locks obediently popped down. As I went to shut my door, I quickly flipped mine back so the car was left unlocked. Otter didn't notice. I rubbed my temple and drooped my head in mock pain. When I reached the trunk of the car, Otter met me and put an arm around my shoulders, guiding his ill son towards the main hospital doors. When we crossed through them, the blast of cool air and the smell of flowers layered over antiseptic hit me. The lobby was decked out in paper butterflies and rainbow-colored rugs. This was the section for everyday illnesses, rather than super serious stuff, and you could tell even the paper butterflies looked sort of bored. Slow down, I whined to Otter, in what I hoped was a Clifton Harris voice. It's freezing in here. That's just because your temperature is so high. Here, take a seat and I'll sign us in, Otter said, ushering me over to a turquoise chair. My stomach clenched. Were we early? We couldn't be early. I chanced lifting my eyes and glanced around the waiting room, then held a sigh of relief. There were a few infants, some harried mothers with young children, and there, off to the side, were Clatterbook and Ben. Mission. Install dual spy programs without Otter noticing, turning me into SRS and putting me in the weeds. Step one. Ben and Clatterbook get to the hospital first. I let my eyes graze over them, but I quickly looked back down at my hands when Ben grinned at me. I was sure he wasn't trying to blow my cover, but he was going to if he kept this up. I saw Clatterbook elbow him through my peripheral vision. Ben's face crumpled, and he went back to pretending to have a terrible stomach bug just as Otter finished with the sign-in sheet and rejoined me. Step 1A. Ben gets called to go back first. Benjamin Smith, a voice called. I didn't look, but I heard Clatterbook and Ben rise and cross the room. Smith, seriously? Clatterbook? No, no. It'll work. It's, it's so obvious. It's, it's forgettable. A door clicked shut, and now I had to wait. Ben had one job, and no matter how small or easy it was, it was important. So much of the mission relied on everyone else doing their parts. As scary as it was, I think I preferred breaking into the League. At least there, I had to rely only on myself. Clifton Harris, 
the same voice called several minutes later. I let Otter spring up before me. Then I rose slowly and dragged my feet behind him. The nurse, who called my name, smiled at me, then ushered me through the door. I'd actually never been to a real hospital before. SRS had its own medical staff, of course, and they oversaw everything from allergies to knee replacement surgery. I badly wanted to look around at the bustle of nurses and doctors, study the bulletin board of notes, and listen in on conversations in case I ever needed to replicate them someday for a disguise. The nurse brought me around a corner and took my weight, then measured my height, just like at SRS, and then also like at SRS. We'll need a urine sample, of course, she said brightly. Like asking someone for pee was a happy thing. Right, I said, keeping my voice low and sickly. I plucked the plastic cup from her fingers. Otter made small talk with the nurse while I stepped into the little bathroom and shut the door, crossing my fingers that Ben hadn't been taken to some other bathroom after he'd been checked in. I hurried over to the toilet and very carefully took the lid off the back of the tank. Step two, Ben plants the flash drive in the bathroom. I grinned. There, floating in a sealed sandwich bag, was a chipped and ancient looking purple flash drive. I fished it from the tank and pocketed the drive. It took me a few seconds more to fill the cup and then I rejoined Otter in the hall. It was so seamless that I'd almost felt uneasy, like the bottom would fall out of the whole thing. The nurse led Otter and me to a small exam room, the kind with the paper bedding. Cartoon characters had been painted on the walls, and there, in the corner, was a computer, complete with fingerprint scanner. I took note that the USB ports were on the side of the monitor. Clifton, a cheery voice said, a male doctor with red angry, speckled hair stepped in. He shook Otter's hand, then mine, and went through a dance of small talk while he pressed a stethoscope to my chest and asked me to take a deep breath. He looked in my eyes and my ears, listened, while I told him I felt tired and my head hurt and how I hadn't missed any school yet but worried I might and I really couldn't because I was getting a good grade in language arts. Not that it really mattered, since I wanted to be a music producer anyway. Clifton Harris was a very complex creature. Well, your results should be finishing up shortly, but I wouldn't worry too much, the doctor said, sliding onto a low stool and facing the computer. He pressed his finger against a reader. The computer obeyed, popping up a form for him to input new patient information. He typed up all my stats and even made a note about how I wanted to be a music producer for future doctor small talk times, I supposed. Looks good. Give me just a minute, Clifton. I'll go grab your chart. He rose, and I saw Otter's hand move towards his pocket where the flash drive with SRS's program was. Footsteps in the hall, heels running, clacking loudly on the tiled floor. The doctor lifted his eyebrows, and then he was nearly smacked in the face as the door to the exam room flung wide open. A wide-eyed nurse stood on the other side, pointing emphatically at Otter. Your car, she said, panting and out of breath. It's in the road. Step three. Clatterbook forces Otter to leave the room. Huh? Otter said. It's in the road. It, it rolled. It's in the middle of the intersection, she said, stepping back. I gritted my teeth in excitement. Clatterbook had come through and done his part. Oh, Otter's jaw locked. His eyes panicked. He looked from me to the doctor and back again. Go, the doctor said swiftly. Hurry. I can't, C Clifton. I'll be fine, Dad. Go, I said urgently, biting my tongue when I finished, punishing myself for calling Otter Dad. Otter gave me a mean look, but he didn't have a choice unless he wanted to totally blow our cover. What kind of man just lets his car sit in an intersection? He patted me on the shoulder swiftly and then took off down the hallway. I folded my arms over my chest nervously. Catching the flash drive, Otter had seamlessly tucked into my t-shirt collar before it fell all the way through to the floor. The doctor looked back at me. Wow, well, let's hope everything goes fine with that. While he's saving the car, I'll go grab your results. Be back shortly. He slipped out the door, closing it behind him. Step four, install the programs. 
I leaped up and charged to the computer, nearly knocking the whole thing over as I slid onto the doctor's chair. I popped SRS's flash drive into the computer's USB port. I knew exactly how to install it. Uploading spy software was something we'd learned in Kennedy's grade. I clicked through, tapping my foot anxiously. A caterpillar green progress bar inched along painfully slow. It finally loaded, and I typed frantically, making sure the program was deeply hidden inside the operating system. The relief I felt when everything was complete was short-lived. I yanked out Beatrix's bright purple flash drive and fumbled to push it in the USB. Nerves were getting to me. I took a deep breath. Beatrix's program popped up, a white wall of text. I typed what she instructed me to yesterday. Beatrix is cooler than Ben. The screen flashed for a moment, then it all went black, and I felt the thick taste of panic rise in me. Something had gone wrong. We'd tripped a firewall. She'd accidentally wiped a system. The computer simply couldn't handle the program. The screen returned. It looked normal. A chart with Clifton Harris's name on it. Huh? I said aloud, marveling at Beatrix's work. I heard a rustle outside. A step, a hand on the doorknob. I yanked the flash drive from the computer and dived onto the bed. Clifton, good news, the doctor said brightly, sweeping back into the room a millisecond after my butt hit the bed. I think odds are that you've just got a bug. I've written you a prescription. The doctor paused to yank the top sheet off his pad. Why don't you go back to the lobby to wait for your dad? When I got to the lobby, I found the urge to laugh. No, wait, that was putting it too mildly. I fought the urge to fall on the floor, laughing and pointing like a cartoon character. Otter was standing in the middle of an intersection beside his boxy-shaped car, surrounded by cars with smashed bumpers and shattered headlights. Other drivers were shouting at him, hands on their hips and faces stretched in anger. Otter was yelling back, which wasn't helping. I suspected one woman was three seconds away from taking a swing. It was perfect. The hospital was focused on new patients now, so I slunk out the front door and hurried over to help him. Beatrix's purple flash drive made a pleasant plunk as I talked it in, tossed it into the teddy bear fountain on my way to the intersection. Forget it, man. We're not letting you drive off. It's illegal not to have insurance in this state, you know. An angry old man howled at Otter. He looked like the center of a rage and car-shaped flower. You're the one who hit my car, Otter snapped back, livid. He was hanging onto the open driver's side door, like it was holding him back from charging everyone down. You're the idiot who forgot to pull his parking brake. You're lucky the car didn't hurt someone when it rolled through the intersection. Otter stared at the car and made a combination of vowel sounds that were supposed to be words, but he hadn't quite cooked long enough inside his brain. I could tell he was trying to remember if he'd pulled the parking brake or not. I, of course, knew he had. It was just that I'd left my door unlocked so that Clatterbook could drop the brake and give the car a nice shove. I hadn't expected Clatterbook to shove it quite this hard, though. I figured the car would end up tapping the edge of the teddy bear fountain, or maybe denting a nearby car, stopping traffic in the center of a major intersection. This was a little more than I'd bargained for when I set up the plan last night, and it was all starting to freak me out a little. In the distance, I heard the faint sound of police sirens. We had to get out of there before the cops came, because from the twisted look on Otter's face, he didn't prepare false insurance or a false driver's license. Getting arrested wasn't rare for SRS members, but getting arrested for something like a traffic violation? That was just embarrassing. Plus, it would mean that no one would remember how successful our mission was. They'd just remember how big a mess had been made at the end of it. As much as the idea of Otter in handcuffs thrilled me, I had to get us out of here. I looked around, taking stock of what we could use, but there was nothing except a fallen bumper or two some broken glass, and an ever-growing crowd of onlookers, staring like this was some sort of incredibly boring movie. Movie? That'll work. Whoa, wait, is that gasoline? I said, frantically pointing to a pool of liquid underneath Otter's car. It wasn't gasoline. 
It was just windshield wiper fluid. If I was remembering emergency car acquisition, or what we affectionately called Grand Theft Auto class correctly. It is. Dad, we've got to get away. The whole thing might blow up. People's eyes widened, otters included. They looked at the gasoline and hurriedly backed up towards their cars like they weren't positive they believed me, but they'd seen plenty of car explosions in movies. And just like Ben, back at the league, they all assumed that movies were correct. Otter suddenly realized what I was doing and ducked into the driver's seat and slammed the door. He unlocked the doors at the same moment he turned the key in the ignition. I'd barely shut my door before he peeled out of the intersection through the space the other cars had left when they slunk away from the potentially exploding car. I was relieved. I expected Otter to be too, but he mostly looked shaken. I'd have felt bad for him if I didn't dislike him so much. So, the program is installed. I had plenty of time. Everything should be good, I said curtly. I pulled the gray SRS flash drive from my pocket and dropped it in the cup holder unceremoniously. I must have not pulled the parking brake. I didn't say anything. He continued, voice blank. It nearly messed up the whole mission. Do you know my mission success rate? It's perfect. Absolutely perfect. What about the Acapulco incident my dad mentioned? That wasn't my fault. I didn't know the parrot could talk. Otter finally exploded, sending spit all over the windshield. I shrunk back as he continued to mutter angrily to himself about parking brakes and parrots. It wasn't until we were well out of the city and nearly back to SRS headquarters that he calmed down. At a stoplight, he turned to me. You're not to tell anyone about the incident with the parking brake. What? Why not? It's going in your mission report anyway. I Hail Jordan, he said, his voice dangerous. You are not to tell anyone. Are we clear? I ran my tongue across my teeth. Otter was annoying and he hated me, and he was entirely too sensitive about whatever happened in Acapulco, but he was still a dangerous man to cross. However, this was too perfect a chance to pass up. I shook my head. I'm not lying for you. You'd have told everyone at SRS if I'd been the one to screw up the whole thing. For a second, I was actually afraid Otter was going to punch me. Instead, he gripped the steering wheel tighter, ignoring the fact that the light had changed. Fine, I'll tell everyone there was a problem, and you had to install the program. Make you out to be a real hero, but no one hears that I forgot to pull the brake. Okay, that fixes half of it, I said, nodding because I saved your butt by installing the program, but I saved your butt again by creating a diversion so we could escape in the intersection before the cops showed up. You owe me for that, too. Otter cursed loudly, several times, and in several languages. I could practically see the battle in his head. Which was worse, admitting to everyone that Hale Jordan saved him, or admitting to Hale Jordan that he owed him? Fine. What do you want for the second one? I want to go on another mission. You're not a junior agent, he hissed. I shrugged and cursed several times in English. Fine. I'll tell Director Fishburne that I think you should go on another mission, but that's the best I can do. Perfect.